Well, hey, Internet, it's Steve at Thousand Year Homes. Look at the Rembrandt lighting. What's going on is the storm's coming in the next couple of days, and uh, so I'm back inside the house. I'll have to move you around. So there we go, and I'm not standing in front of it. It'll, it'll focus. All right, so what tools am I going to use? Well, I'm going to use, of course, my tape. And I saw a couple of comments say, hey, the paper tape is stronger, and uh, don't use it. Use it with hot compound. Don't use it with... Uh, don't use it with uh, wet mud. Listen, uh, I, I'm not a professional. I'm an itinerant builder, do-it-yourself builder. If I was a professional, maybe I'd have all the equipment for mud, uh, mudding with tape in addition to time. I have uh, mudded and done, uh, I don't know, five houses, 10 houses with this. Lived in them for years and years, it never cracks. The only thing that occasionally happens if I don't uh, sand it well enough, uh, transmits the grids to uh, you know the viewer and then the next time I paint I make sure I fix that spot so uh, you know paints not forever so I fix the walls as I go too so so with that goes a nice sharp knife I like this Milwaukee it doesn't break my tips it slides right in got a brand new sharp knife and then as I pack the mud in I pack the mud in with uh, you know a nice little scraper I love this uh, stainless steel scraper uh, I like it better than that. See, that's rusty, but I cleaned it. I just didn't oil it, so I cleaned it. Um, I like these little metal pans. They last forever. This one's probably 20 years old. <laughs> maybe, maybe 20 years old. So, uh, and then, of course, the corner trowel. And I do wear these out. What happens is I hit enough nails that I put a little ding, ding in it. I suppose you could resurface the edge if you were so inclined, but uh, I just go buy a new one when that happens and... Happens in eight, five, eight years, I wear the edges out. So those are the tools that I'm gonna be using today while I do the mud. Let's take a look here. So what we have going on is we have the uh, corners of, uh, uh, corners and just that one seam, I saw another seam uh, when I had to use eight foot sheets. So all the corners I'll do, along the post I'll do. Of course, I'll fill in all these screws. In addition, I see that there's a couple more. Uh, I know there's a power box in there I have to cut out. A power box there. No power box there. I don't remember there. So I'll go back through and look at my old videos. Uh, which brings up a neat point. This is a video journal. It, um, and it's how I'm building my house. A lot of what I do is to remind myself what I did when I did it. Like I'll have to look at those power boxes to know. Did I put one in over there? I don't remember. But I'll look also at the pipe and know if the pipe goes that way uh, that I likely did. So this one bigger opening, I think I left open in case I ever wanted to cut a door in at some point in time. So I don't believe there's any mechanicals in that spot. But I think there's an outlet there. Oh no, gonna have to look. Uh, so I'm not giving you uh, guidance. Going back to those professionals that said, hey, don't use the, the tape the way you're using it. Well, I've used it that way a long time. And if I was a professional, I'd probably follow uh, best practices and I'd certainly follow code, right? Certainly follow code. But I'm not, and uh, which gives me the freedom to break the rules. As I'm just doing now, I'm, I'm the, as far as I know, I'm the first person to laminate uh, a shipping container home with Santa Fe Mission style. You know, uh, do it at your own risk. Also, uh, I'm in a hot climate here in Central Texas. So there's a difference between the way you build in the north and the south. In the north, you put the vapor barrier on the outside and you're trying to keep the heat and humidity on the inside because you have central heat and it's very dry. In the south, you're trying to keep the cool on the inside, so your vapor barriers are on the inside, and your reflective material, your insulation's on the outside. So, if I were to build this house, I built it with the idea that uh, it'll work in my climate, but if I was up in Alaska, I think it would be spray foam, and I think I'd do six uh, full two by fours out to get maximum insulation and I'd spray right against the uh, uh, the metal. The reason I didn't do that here is that my biggest risk is uh, wildfires. And so I'm building this house to be able to survive hopefully a wildfire including an ember storm. So everything uh, that I do, I wanna make sure it sheds away and eventually I'll keep work doing the land, uh, you know, clearing brush and doing things like that. 
Uh, but to keep that in mind, that uh, even if I do something that works for here, you got to consider a lot of things in your neck of the woods and do your own research and, and whatnot. But uh, I like this, and uh, for those of you who say, ah, you should be using tape up there, I, I know that. Uh, I know what the rules say. Uh, I'm also a do-it-yourself or so. I could break the rules when I know I can break the rules, and I can't. I've done this for years. Uh, just like when I put earth bag over culverts with some rebar in it, and I drive a truck over, I still got people saying I can't do it. Well, there it is. And if I was on, a, oh, I, I've done that a long time. There it is. I don't know what to say. I, I'm not text dot. I'm not building for highway traffic. I'm building for a tractor to take a radius and not drop a wheel on a culvert. Uh, anyway, but all these things, they're designed to be mostly entertaining. And uh, as a video journal for me, so I remember where I left off because sometimes I have things to do. Yesterday I played with my grandson. All the work I do playing with my grandson is the hardest work. I'll tell you, you get a little older. I'm glad I had kids young, I gotta tell you, because I can't keep up the little guy. And uh, he does things that I would rather he didn't do. He's physically able to do them, uh, but they scare me, right? Like riding a bike at three or whatever he was. I mean, full on, evil can evil riding bike. I just, it just gets me. I was the same way though. So anyway, going back to the house, tying that all back, uh, I could take a risk because this is all my money. This is a bank money. This is my money. So uh, if you're doing a bank, right, you're funded, they're gonna have they're gonna have a stake in that game and they're not gonna let you, you know, free build <laughs> like I'm doing. All right, let me set up and we'll we'll get this going. Uh, I've got a couple of days of rain. I'm hoping to get it all mudded and final coated and everything in a couple of days. We'll find out. And then the other thing I do while uh doing that, I actually go back through and dimple any screws. If there's some, you know, I push on the drywall and if I see a little wobble like that, let's go ahead and just tighten that up. You can't put too many screws in because um, it'll make it weak. I just use the back of the knife to smooth the uh, corners out and get the tape pressed down on there nice and firm. Uh, the nice thing about drywall is if um, I make a mistake on this pass, then the next time that I uh, I paint, uh, I'll, I'll catch it. I'll fix it. So no harm, nor foul. Uh, just move forward, right? That's the most important thing is uh, moving forward in what you're doing. I guess that's um, moving forward is is a big deal. <laughs> like, you know, there's times in your life you'll say, "Oh, I'll diet," and then you don't die diet. And then there's times in your life you'll say, "Oh, I'll diet," and you do, and you're super successful, right? It's all a matter of attitude and where you're at with body and mind. And the same thing with the build project. If you're going to build a house. One, uh, solo building is, is definitely difficult, uh, especially heavy stuff, but also self-motivating. You know, when I'm uh, tired or I've already done something for my uh, work, it's hard for me then to come out and say, oh, let me also do, uh, you know, let me also do drywall, uh, especially if I've had a full day. So... But uh, for me, the self-motivation part has been extremely difficult. Uh, one, it's, it's taken me longer than I expected because of the COVID problems and, uh, you know, no materials and sh part shortages. Uh, but also, I've had a drought down here in Texas, a, a massively mean-spirited drought that uh, has made this all difficult. to keep moving forward. 
the heat uh, is was just as much a a, uh, a resistance as pocketbook would be, let's say, or you know, anything else. Now I'm pretty good at getting things done, long-term projects done, uh, and I do them with a lot of grace, so people are like, um, they're not seeing the progress while I'm doing it. And that was true in my college life, or uh, family life, or whatever. I think because a lot of things are easy for me that people don't see the struggle. Or they just see the completed project. Like, you know, people who visit me once every six months, they'll come out and they'll see a lot done. When you're in it day in and day out, you don't see a lot done. You see the next task, and the next task, and the next task, and the next task. Here, let me show you something. So this little sheet here uh, is my, I was, out at, I was out getting a dinner one day and I didn't have my cell phone. So I got all old school. I found a, uh, you know, a piece of paper and a pen and I wrote. So I, I'm putting down where I'm at, framing, drywall piers, electric logging. These are the big projects. Solar, flooring, bathroom, uh, disking the fields, taking care of the house, right? Uh, and then big, big projects, you know, I got to solve for water. I need to do the hyper Adobe, the great hall, stock ponds, the kitchen, right? So these are big, big things, uh, little things that I think can get done along the way, storm windows so that I don't have any leakage in the house, delivery of mulch. Uh, somebody said that they have as much mulch as I want, so I could make my mulch driveways. Uh, I just got to figure out how not to let it dry, wash away. Um, restore the trailer, that's the horse trailer, uh, doing one nice video a week. And I started last week by doing a training video on the walls. Um, uh, but then in the middle of all the framing drywall, whatnot, I need to squeeze in gardening. I need to squeeze in the stairs. What you saw, I bought stairs for outside, but the, uh, by the doorway entries, I need to do, uh, finish up setting up the sawmill, get the Italian plaster up, wash the rest of the tiles. Uh, clean the second connex. Oh, it's a mess. Uh, then the bathroom part, ventilation, sink, cabinets, finish, build, blah, 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 blah. So um, as a solo builder, or if you're a couple builder and you get distracted, uh, you probably will never get done. <laughs> this is why we pay people to come and do our houses, right? Because they're, they're paid to get it done. They come every day. They're focused on the energy. Uh, also, uh, if you uh, watch YouTube people, you should thank them. Not just uh, pumping myself up to get likes or subscribes, but I mean your content providers that you watch all the time. I like the Perkins Brother. I like Vice Grip Garage. Uh, there's a bunch of them that I watch on a regular basis. The Woodworkers, Stumpy Nubs, and all of those guys. I love them. Uh, just take a time out every now and then, of course, like their videos. That's how you get algorithm. If you like somebody's video, it helps. YouTube will keep promoting it. If you don't like it at a certain point, and it doesn't take much, like if my videos fall below like 95% like, YouTube just yanks them. And people sometimes don't like my videos because uh, maybe it hit the wrong demographic. Maybe it hit teenagers instead of uh, 24 and on up, like uh, really like my videos. They're the biggest watchers. And I think the 24 crowd is because of the tiny home and that they uh, they don't have a lot of money let normally and like normally, you know, they're just starting out in life. Houses are $500,000, $5,000 a month, 20% down. So a, a, a $500,000 house is uh, $50, $100,000 down. It's just ridiculous. How can young people get started? And then we want to pay them $9 an hour. Come on. So, uh, but shipping containers are in the realm of doable. And, you know, I'm on 30 acres with a lot of extra equipment for farming, but a dedicated family, a couple, don't go get married and have kids, but get married and be a couple, could do this all by their lonesome. Uh, but if you don't finish projects, you really need to think about starting something like this because uh, I finish projects. Uh, it's what I do. And I do it so gracefully that people are always like, did you, did you do all that? That 
scripture, they're always surprised. And I, I got to live with that. It's a little humiliating, to be honest, to get asked that. Did you really do that? But I don't know, you know, I just think space elves came down and did it. Space aliens came down and built my house. I tell people that because I get that often enough, uh, the incredulous, no way did you build that uh, or do that thing. Uh, I, my whole life I've gotten that kind of thing. I had a really hard P chemistry class and I was the only one to finish all the labs. And instead of the con professor congratulating me, he accused me of cheating. Because <laughs> nobody, nobody ever finished all the labs. Oh my gosh. He, he, I had to go to the dean. Because uh, he was, that uh, professor was sure I had cheated. Because his class was the hardest class in the world. And nobody could finish his class. And he was brilliant. What is wrong with professors like that? Why don't they make it? You know what? An A does a, an A in life or an A at your job, perfect to, uh, performance at your job, isn't godlike. It's what a human being can do. So, uh, you know, don't make your classes in college so hard nobody can do it. That's stupid. How, how, how dumb. Make it so that it's a challenge for a uh, talented person to successfully complete. And in life, when they do employee per appraisals, they gave up years ago. Uh, my current employer, thank God, doesn't have employee for appraisals. But many employee appraisals that I had, I put myself at 100%. 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100. And then I'd make each supervisor, if he wanted to put me down, fight to put me down. And then, uh, you know, like, uh, let's say I did 10,000 email a year or something like that. I I've always been real successful. And my boss, I... You know, I'm in a top 20% of performance. And then he would say, well, you weren't that good. And I'd say, well, then what is normal? Oh, normal is only 2,000. Okay, well, I'll put my performance down at 2,000 emails instead of 10 a year so that you could put me at the 80% and neither one of us are mad. And then I would do it. <laughs> so bosses learned a long time ago, don't mess with me uh, on a performance review because I will stand up for myself. Uh, and so then I, well, what, what is everybody else doing? 20% and is that where, I, you know, that's what uh, the 80, they always want to put you down as need work, right? No matter how, how good you are. Needs work. <laughs> Needs work. <laughs> Because nobody's perfect. Well, then don't have an employee appraisal. If you if a human being can't do the job, the job can't be done, right? But or otherwise, give people the credit they're due. There's you can never hurt a person by by being positive and helping them. You just can't hurt a person. So uh, anyway, so but I would I would make those for, oh annual performance review, and it became kind of a joke. I'm so glad I'm in a place that doesn't do that. Instead, we have one-on-ones that are on a regular basis, and that is a much more positive environment because, um, well, I've got a good boss, but um, it's also a more positive approach for employees because one-on-one uh, -on -one lets you align your, your goals with whatever it is that the business wants to accomplish. And uh, those of you who have not, this is maybe your first time tuning in, this isn't my full-time job. I'm an off-grid do-it-yourselfer building this house by myself. Um, uh, and I'm using uh, two shipping containers to make a very modern house using ancient materials like adobe as well as modern construction. So that's why you see log and rough timbers around me. and I'm sawmilling stuff and cutting my own timbers. Um, so let, let me get you down here where I'm working next. So uh, anyway, that's uh, that's what I'm working on. Uh, but uh, I make a video, oh, almost week, uh, daily, almost daily. I'm dialing it back here this coming up here because I want to have more high quality. I should theoretically be done with this bedroom and living in it. So that will raise my standard of living and then I can work on the uh, timber frame great hall, which will have a reciprocal ceiling. If I get time, I'll put up a what a reciprocal ceiling is. But it, it's all logging and big stuff, uh, bigger than this. But I think a young couple, going back to the $500,000 a year, and I will have a, have a show on this. I'm gonna build this particular uh, 
shipping container. Well, delivery uh, was uh, on-site delivery leveled the way I wanted, uh, which was on the ground, was $5,200. And then I have everything straight and uh, level and all my 90 degrees done. And, you know, yours would be different in your neck of the woods. I've also learned don't call when you go for your permits. Don't call these shipping containers because it causes a lot of governmental strife. Um, as well as quoting it, then they all want to quote what they think, you know, the latest trendy million dollars to drywall it or something. It's 320 square feet. So um, call it a steel frame structure if you're uh, off out in a rural area. Everybody will understand steel frame structure. And to be honest, farmers have been building with uh, shipping containers way before they became trendy. So, uh, because they're practical. Now, the down parts, if you've been watching it, is the heat and the drought has been up against me and whatnot. So there I fixed one part. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead, I made a terrible mistake. Let me fo focus on that terrible mistake. Remember where I said I, I don't always mark the power boxes. And on this power box I missed. So let me fix that so you all can see how I fix power box uh, big mistakes. So let's say that was a door punch or something like that. Now uh, apologies for the shadowing, it, it's just uh, a rainy day out there. But you see how I had punched a, uh, uh, cut out a, a wrong spot. My problem was I made a little hole and then I felt in and I felt the metal. <laughs> of this so I thought I was there so then I cut it all the way out and lo and behold I was up normally I mark on the uh, you know the floor and the uh, next exposed beam uh, where those are but there's a couple there's two this will be my second one here so I'm not crazy or lazy or anything like that and of course when I put my drywall saw all the way in it, it would tink 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 against the uh, shipping container so I, th I thought I was in a power box and I'm not so let's go ahead and fix that up. So there we go. This this went right in there. But uh, this would be the same method you could use to uh, to fix up a uh, a uh, oh door hole or some uh, young man, uh, angry young person punches a wall. I've never done that. I don't understand people who do that. So. <laughs> We all grow up a little bit. So uh, here you go. So a couple of things. Uh, you put a little piece of, of that tape, right? You put a little piece of tape in there. You kind of make it, you know, just, just big enough to do that. And then you overlap another piece of tape. Let me go ahead. I'll just cut this piece off right here. I don't know if it'll overlap. Let me make that one bigger. All right. All right, so there you go. I got a little bit of this tape in there, just roughly sitting in there. And then I take my piece that, uh, normally it wouldn't be like that, right? And then you just kind of put it back in there. And that's uh, a handy part of, of this particular tape. And I'll go ahead and put a piece on the bottom and make sure, yeah, I, I, I cut that right. That's, it's doing that. I'll run one here that way. So there you go. And then when I float mud on there, it'll just fix right up. My mistake won't even show up. Everybody, everybody can feel good. Including me. And uh, also because I cut that so thin, you know, I want to reinforce that a little bit. So it'll reinforce it at the same time. I shouldn't have made this mistake. <laughs> that's, that's what I shouldn't have done. But it, or literally, I popped that hole in there and I felt around. I could feel the tin. I could hear it. Oh, I'm there. Thank God. 
first time. I was even excited I did it the first time. I got it all right, right from the start. Then I cut it all the way out. <laughs> not, not even close. See, there, I've rolled over a little bit of the uh, fiberglass right there. And I don't want a big ball of fiberglass. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, pick that off. All right. Let's go ahead and finish, finish fixing my boo. When that dries, I'll cut that tape out of there. For the second coat, I'll come in with a 12 inch trowel, but for now, this will do. Like it never happened. That's the right way to use that tape to patch a hole in a wall. Alright, so normally I want to just do a section at a time. I would tape it all and do it all. But uh, I might run in for dinner tonight. And there's only one restaurant open on a Sunday here in this town. And it's the Mexican restaurant. And... Uh, Oh, look at that. I I push up on these to make sure they're all tight. It is. Look at that. I did this one. I did this in another episode, so I was busy. But let's finish this one up. I'm going to take these down. They're just telling me where the rafters are. All right. Forgot to chase that. I'm careful where I lay this down because if you lay it down in a bunch of drywall dust, the drywall dust will get in there and then it won't stick right. And also if you already stick it and then peel it off like you did, I just cut it off. These are pretty cheap. So like I had stuck that up and then I changed my mind. I want to, there's some little uh, paper tags hanging down that I didn't do yet. And uh, I changed my mind. So I'll just throw that one away. There, I cut it off and throw it away. I usually ball it up because if you throw it down on the ground unballed, then step on it, <laughs> it's really hard to get up sometimes. All right, so I made a mistake there. Let me fix my mistake. Cut these all off. I'm going to get my safety glasses. I could tell that. All right. Oh, they just don't stand under it. blowing in the wind. I got a big storm brewing out there. Well, it's been sputtering rain. So I'm uh, trying to get this done. My apologies for the dark video. I, I know I do a lot of dark videos. Two things, I'm off grid so uh, my power is uh, on when I want it. It's an on-demand power thing. So during the day I like it quiet and uh, so when there's not natural sunlight <coughs> The videos like this are a little dark. This isn't too bad. Uh, I cut them at a little bevel and get rid of the extra paper and uh, that way I can push mud up in there and get a good good bond between the rafter and the sheetrock. And you know, plaster and wood go together like peas and corn, like Jenny and Forrest.
So uh, it mostly sticks, uh, you know, as the wood expands down through the years, I'm expecting a little bit of uh, separation and I'm looking forward to it. I find, find a little crack, some cracks, charming, charming. And that's my, my opinion. You wouldn't want that in a, in a high-end ultra mod home, you know, it would look funny. But in a, a mission style home where you want to make it look like it's been there for a hundred years, well, you know, let it settle a little bit. Give it some character. Give it some character. There we go. Now I think I can tape this without the paper. And then the other thing that happens if there's loose paper and you don't cover it with uh, drywall or whatever, let's say that I had a little tear in here and I just ignored it. When you paint it, the paint will get underneath the, the uh, white paper, which is a little water resistant, and get in the brown and swell the brown. And then uh, you'll get a bubble. So there you go. As I tape, I do a final inspection of the drywall. So I had a drill and screws and things that I'm stepping on here. Now in the corner corners with drywall to drywall, I fold the tape. You see how it's folded right there? But on these edges where I'm going up against the uh, where I'm going up against the post, I just ride it along and kind of scrunch it. So like if there's uh, one piece of fiber that's sticking out from the edge of the tape, I kind of squish that in there where it's just touching. Uh, and this seems to be working for me. Uh, you know, keep in mind I'm attached mechanically to a shipping container. So <laughs> I, I got some temperature load change out there going on and uh, but I've, I've done it this way for more than a year and it's it's uh, worked out just fine so uh, no problem at all and then like I said once it's down I give it the once over with the knife you know I'm going to be honest here in Texas no matter what people say, uh, I see a lot of houses, brand new, brand new construction, stick built homes by big names. And I go in for the tour and I'll see cracks in the corner already. And uh, I think either they, they didn't compress the clay right or they're on black gumbo. You, black gumbo will just, it rolls and just changes dimension. I'm on a reddish clay here, and when it gets wet, it doesn't seem to expand. I haven't had any big cracks during the two years of drought. Uh, just a little crinkling on the top. And when I leveled this on the temporary blocks, it stayed right where it was. So the roof is just a repeat of the corners. Now that I cut loose all of the extra uh, paper tabs that would have gotten in my way, now I'm just going to Put it in and squish it down just so it touches the beam. And, uh, you know, I'll push it and, uh, you know, follow it up. And I make a decent contact with it. And I won't move the camera. I'm going to go off screen because I can't move the camera and finish this project. It's, you know, eight foot long. I'll be back in just a second. All right. And then once I have it down, I'll... I'll take my knife and just the edge of it and just make sure it's really attached to the wall or ceiling in this case. Here's my second seam and this one I made because it was so many compounds and then there's a, a post up there, a round post, so I needed to cut a round post. I needed to make this notch. So this is my second one that has a, uh, a seam. So two seams in this whole place uh, that aren't at the ceiling joint that they're in the middle. And uh, I didn't want to do that but it was too heavy and too complex for me to 
to stick up there all by my lonesome uh, as just one big sheet. Maybe if I would have had help, maybe I could pull it off, but I don't know. I still think it was a two, two, uh, two worker kind of, kind of a project. <laughs> it was fairly complex. I usually try to do, always do the, uh, the cross pieces first and then the long pieces second. Oh, look, there's some more tape. Tape, little tape tabs. I'll replace this blade in just a minute because it's beginning to not do what I need it to do. It's, um, blades are cheap, you know. All right. So I try to overlap is what I, I'm trying to get to. So I'll do the cro shorter cross pieces and then I come in with the long piece and tie it together. Most of the time. This particular one, because I had used it as a demonstration, is partially done earlier. Uh, I did how to, how to drywall to a live edge log, which uh, I did over in that corner. So. so it's partially done here, and that's not a normal condition. Normally I tape everything, and really realistically, if I was ambitious, I would have taped everything um, I would have taken the whole container uh, and then did it, but that's not how it worked out. This is the stringiest I've had this particular tape. I don't know what brand it is, but I'm going to look at it before I uh, try not to buy it again. It just says fiber tape. It's not a name brand. I really don't like it. It's got a lot of strings, and I cut a lot of strings off. But I've had better 3M, I've had better tape than this. That's the other problem with having ordering and having people deliver stuff to you. They bring you the crap that nobody wants to buy, the professionals, just to get the inventory off their shelves. So I've kind of stopped having Lowe's and Home Depot bring me anything because they, they don't bring me what I would buy. Um, McCoy still does a good job picking out high quality stuff, but Home Depot and Lowe's is really all about getting rid of inventory they don't like, and uh, <laughs> it's usually not good stuff. If it's sitting there or dusty, there's probably a reason it's dusty. All right, well this will be the last time I use this knife blade. Uh, I've cut, I put in a new knife blade for the next section. Again, I build these in four foot increments, uh, but uh, having a whole bunch of little paper tabs is inconvenient and my knife isn't sharp enough to, to cut them anymore. A lot of the times I'll speed walk uh, these videos, but every now and then I, I want to give a realistic expectation to people. Uh, as well as go, oh, why didn't I get that drywalled all in a day? <laughs> when I'm not that fast. Those drywall gangs that come in and uh, on stilts and knock those out, man, those, they, they do it every day, all day long, eight hours a day. I build a house or remodel a house once every eight years. Uh, it's not the same efficiency of scale, you know. So it takes me a lot longer to do a project then it would be a, a gang of workers. Ooh, a brand new thing of drywall mud. How nice, how nice. So the first thing I'll do is clean the top off. I don't want any of that dust and I see sand, I see things in there. Clean that off. Ooh. Before I change my knife blade, where did I leave my knife blade? That's still my old knife blade. Then go ahead and cut that out. Take care of that. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Let's look together, Internet. Let's, I wish I had, you know, they make a little five gallon pail 
wrench so you don't break your nails off. Man, it hurts like heck when you break your nails off on these. Woo! I'm so excited! Good mud. Oh! Is it good mud? It looks like a lemon. I don't know. I don't know. I wanted it like Jiffy. I wanted it like Jiffy. Oh, yeah. I wanted it like Jiffy peanut butter. And you know, at night, sometimes when I'm, as I'm using these, I pour just a little bit of water in them at night and do all that. Yeah, that's, ask me if I'm gonna mix up this whole thing. No, that's why I add a little water as I go. I'm not. I don't put them away like that. I make them smooth and that way you don't have, you know, little tips getting all hard. So let's get us some drywall mud. Now this should have been crystal clear if I really, 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 really cared. You know, there's different classifications of drywall mud and you could pay for it in your house. And I don't know which is the highest class. Let's say class A. Man, that means like no mistakes. Zero flaws. All the corners meet perfect at perfect degrees. And uh, there's no weirdness, no waves. To get that, you pay good money for that. I knew I wasn't capable of that. So I'm doing a Spanish mission, which will look like a, you know, pueblo person did it. And, uh, because that's what I am. Off First thing I do is kind of jam it in a little bit. Get a little bit jammed in there. It's not a race for the swiftest, it's a marathon. Not a sprint. That's how the expression goes. Not a sprint, it's a marathon. And I squish it in there pretty good. Maybe that's why it works for me, because I take the time to squish it in. Professional drywallers, they're all in a hurry. They got bills to feed and other projects to do. I ain't got nothing. This this thing should have been primed, but I'm gonna do that. There was a little scratch in the paper there. Maybe that'll hold it down. All right. No, I tape off these beams because I don't tape off anything. <laughs> as long as it takes to tape, I can uh, usually get it clean. But if you are really, really uh, bad at drywall and you're doing live timbers and you want to put an edge on there, just make sure you leave a little spot for the uh, for the drywall to bond to the timber. And then the other thing, if you've been watching my videos, is I didn't pre-treat these, pre-stain them, pre-anything, uh, because no oil on them, uh, and I debated that, but I decided the plastering was more important than the uh, putting on uh, a finish early. So when I'm done and I get ready to do the Italian plaster, I might, I might, coat all of those uh, beams with um, tongue oil or some such oil, even cedar oil. It, mm. It's a cedar, it's a cedar thing. Maybe I'll coat it with cedar oil. I could cut linseed with cedar oil to save the cost and just kind of do that. So this is the way I do it. I do a real rough coat and uh, get it all jammed in there. I'm really pressing in and really forcing it into the corner. I'm uh, getting it through the mesh. I can tell it's getting through the mesh. And uh, I'm not a real wide because I want to come back in with the angle trowel and push that all in with the angle trowel and put an edge in a, a square edge. So I'm not going real wide, but I'm pressing pretty hard. And then, you know, I'll go back in, I'll break the highs, 
and uh, then come in with the angle trowel. Same thing along the live edge of the timber. And uh, for those of you who have watched my thing, you'll know that, that the mud I had when I did the timber was really old, like cottage cheese. But I wasn't too worried because I knew that I would be doing a final coat, maybe even two. Uh, and then the Italian plaster, of course, has a dimension too. I'm not using paint. I'm using Italian plaster when I choose to <clears throat> put the color on this. So I've already got the Italian plaster here. There's a little quartz in the Italian plaster, so it'll have a, a luster to it. And I'm really looking forward to that. All right, I see right there I missed a little piece of tape. I'm gonna put it there. Might not need it, but it's how I do this process, so. I'll go ahead and do that corner now that I've got the mud packed into it. So then you take your angle your angle trowel like this and uh, what I do is I take and I put a little bit just uh, a little bit like just like that I'll zoom up in there so you can kind of sort of see it all right so then I have a little bit right there I just press it into the corner and then as I'm going, I change the angle of the, uh, of the angle trowel and I flatten it out. And so that part looks pretty good. Let's finish up the rest of it. I'll zoom into that part, huh? So, and then I just keep working and I've got a little bit of mud there and I just press it in wherever it overlaps like that. I go back the other way and uh, pretty good. And then when I go and do the second coat, it'll square that right up. And if there's any, any tape showing or anything like that, I usually catch it at that time. And to make it look real good. Real good. So again, I'm, I'm uh, doing it just a little bit at a time because I want to press in. Uh, get it uh, right in between and get it bounded, bound rather, to the, uh, the cedar post. So, you know, I'm really pressing with this, this, this coat. Then I'll take the six inch trowel and I'll come back in and smooth it all. Oh, darn it, I didn't want to get anything on this shirt. Hmm. If I tried to clean my shirt right now, it will uh, mush all over and make a mess. So, Oh man, I did it again. Oh man, I did it again. I went over and did a load of laundry the other day and uh, my daughter's laundry was in there and every one of her clothes, every one, was stained with paint. <laughs> I was so proud of her. And she said to me the same thing that I said. She says, I have paint clothes. She says, but I get up, I start the day, and uh, whatever I'm wearing, I end up working in. How oh, I'm so proud of you. Whatever I'm wearing, I start working it. And that is so true. <laughs> so everything ends up being a paint shirt or a plaster shirt or a, yeah, every, every single thing. <laughs> ruined. All ruined. What are the events? Why well, I'm a bachelor. Or little Leah. She comes out, washes my clothes every now and then. 
Usually I go to my daughter's and wash it like a big boy. I like doing that. It's like I'm coming home from college. I give my daughter a hard time every time. I, I use her laundry soap. Don't even buy her more. Use it up. No, that's not true. I had good kids. They were responsible. But uh, indeed, most of my clothes end up ruined. When I'm all done with this uh, house, I'm going to uh, need to buy new clothes. All right. Well, this one here, I got a little wild on with the jigsaw. Because the other side is a timber. And to get around the knots on that side, I had to really whack it on this side. I ended up with quite a gap here. That's not, the rest of the house doesn't have this kind of a gap. We'll see. We'll see, Internet, if, if it ends up falling apart or what I said's true. That plaster loves timber. Especially this is rough cut, right? And I did the right thing by avoiding adding a stain or a finish or anything. Would have made it easier uh, for the final fit and finish of the timbers, but the plaster wanted a bomb. And I know that I still have to level this house. It's on blocks. So I'm expecting a little bit of character to come in right then when I do that. Let me move the camera. Anyway, I was proud of my baby girl to her, uh, her every, every piece, every stick of clothing. <laughs> she owns every, every stick. <laughs> All dirty. She's still a bed and breakfast, so she's pretty excited about it. That's where I am sometimes. Sometimes I'm helping with that business. Not a lot. She does most of the work. I've got to be honest. I'm better on a tractor than she is. I told her to buy a tractor. And, uh, oh, she borrowed mine. And my grandson drives that tractor like a man. I, I teased her the other day. She's on it using, she's a ex-military veteran. And I saw her using hand signals for the little guy while he's on it. He's four. <laughs> while he's using the back of He's making him dig that trench straight and, and she says don't mess up my yard and I said could you dig that yard that straight and she goes no <laughs> she, that little four year old on that back hole <laughs> make a make a clean trench he could make a clean trench His mama mama has standards And again, I'm, I'm serious about I don't clean up uh, drips while doing it because uh, you'll just make a bigger mess. So just let it dry off and then it flakes right off. You can just flake it right off. And these big ones that I'm doing, we all recognize they're going to crack a little bit while they shrink. And that's why people say, oh, this, uh, this fiberglass won't hold up because it, while it shrinks, it will... Uh, um, pull the strands and break them. Well, fiberglass just moves. I mean, they don't shrink six inches, they shrink millimeters, and hundreds of millimeters. And then they've also said in the mud that as it dries, it'll cut a little vein in the mud. I don't believe that one. That, not even a little. <laughs> uh, anyway, long story short, I've done this for years, 40 years, and lived in the houses where the, my eye could see it. And I had houses that had leveling problems and uh, Texas foundation problems. And once I do this, they don't crack. So I appreciate uh, the help uh, of the professionals. I certainly, if I was doing this for a living, I would do whatever it is that the inspector says to do so that I don't end up having to come back. You know, if a house gets cracked, and you did something new, everybody would blame that new thing. But if a house gets cracks, and it's what everybody's always done, they'll always say, well, houses crack. <laughs> if you do something new, they'll blame the new thing. And that is so true. The one little complaint I have with my local uh, lumber yard in this town is anytime I go in for anything that's outside of their wheelhouse, 
<laughs> Every time, ah, that'll work. <laughs> ah, that'll work. Uh, so I, I've learned that if I go in there and they don't have the product, I don't even ask because I'm just going to get a whole bunch of, ah, oh, that'll work. That'll work. Because so why? Why? Because their granddaddy didn't do it. <laughs> that'll work. <laughs> Listen. Uh, go talking about new stuff. You know, after the Roman Empire fell, we lost toilets, flushable toilets, for 2,000 years. And there had to be a lot of times during the Dark Ages where somebody said, too bad we don't have water falling in the toilets and push... Oh, that won't work, they would have said. <laughs> That's somebody somewhere when they're during the Reformation when they started reading the treatises and they went, oh, flushable toilets. They're back. It's back on the menu, boys. Oh. Not the, it's not always how everybody's been doing it that matters. Physics are physics. Plaster loves wood. As long as you respect that. Remember when things were plaster last? We didn't stop doing that because it didn't work. We stopped doing that because it's really hard. And to saw all those and nail them all and do all of that. Plaster and lath, you still find good walls of that. As long as water didn't get behind it. Plaster and lath will that could be a thousand years. It's just come out of the ground. That's all plaster is, is gypsum right out of the ground, mixed with a little lime. I don't know what other modern stuff, and I, I debated uh, getting the uh, the latex. In there and I just don't know if that will last a thousand years so I didn't get any of the elastomeric uh, which I've used it before elastomeric drywall simply because I'm so it's my channel is thousand year home and I'm trying to build a house that'll last a thousand years and by that I mean if with routine maintenance and an intelligent individual you know every 40 to 100 years, swap out the window, swap out the electric. I put conduit in here so people can pull, pull new electric, as I often kid, or pour neurons in it, or whatever we are using for power in the future. So that's be a thousand years. In a thousand years, that drywall and that uh, corner and that fiberglass can still be there. It's all inert materials. It's not a, a subject to just no, a decay. Uh, so with standard maintenance, that will all be there. I had already scraped my scraped my trowel clean, but I'll, I'll go ahead and just do it. Why not? Two inch spot. I'm going to come back through, and I'm going to uh, redo that whole thing. So now let me get the six inch, and we'll do the six inch float. Now I know the real drywall guys, they use a like a, a square pallet, um, and it might be called a pallet. I think they call it a mortar though. And uh, with a handle on the bottom and they put the mixture mud on it. Uh, I'm not that skilled. I use ready mix. I don't even mix my own. But uh, I might get some more mud on this thing. I see that it's a little thin here and there. All right, and then one last thing. I always, uh, before I put the lid down on the uh, ready mix mud, I always smooth it real smooth. And oh look, the sun's coming out. And then uh, make sure there's no crusties. And I mentioned that before. I didn't show you I did it, but I did. So wherever it is, I kind of favor that side of the trowel. So I'll do that side. And as you scrape the mud, you change the angle so it comes out smooth. It's hard to see the angle, but that's how the uh, the professional guys, when they scrape, they're they're flattening the uh, they're flattening the trowel while they scrape. And that's how it gets super smooth. Now, this is my first coat, which I'm going to call a scratch coat. So I'm not expecting perfection. In addition, this is the first time that I made a gap this big. Uh, and it's just because simply I couldn't get the drywall up around the log because the log was circular. So I, I had to cut it big. 
so that I'd go around the log. So then I put it in and you know I slowly dialed it in a little at a time, a little at a time, trying to avoid uh, this kind of a problem. Uh, where I have this big crack uh, to fill. Oh, and there I am. I'm gonna um, scrape my trowel. I must have had a piece of paper or something. Oh, I see a little bit there too. And I can get that smooth. So I would have liked that to have been a little better. I'm, I'm a pretty good mud guy, I really am. For an amateur. I'm not fast. You want to hire me to do, you know, uh, a house. I want to hire me to do a house. <laughs> not at all. Uh, <laughs> I'd be on me the whole time. Oh my God, how long are you going to take? <laughs> and I'd be like, boss man, I got to make it perfect. Good Lord, we got other people to take care of. Anyway, I get myself, I'd fire myself from my own company if I did this for a living. I'd say you're, I'm too slow. Exactly what I'd say. I started this project because during COVID I couldn't fly overseas and I wanted to get my master's degree at a foreign university. Ireland that had AI and uh, COVID kicked in <laughs> I couldn't go, couldn't go home as, and then when COVID ended and I said oh I'd like to come they said oh we're so far behind we're not taking adult students like you so uh, you know uh, my dreams got that smashed because of COVID so uh, so anyway, uh, I'm still working on this house with the idea that uh, I will be able to travel. And um, I've always been a lifelong learner, so I've always enjoyed the educational process. And uh, I still might go get my master's. Probably don't have time for a doctor. Okay, look at that. Doesn't that look good? Good for a scratch coat. Let's work on this wall right here. And then the shoemaker's elf will come in tonight with the lights on and he'll magically get these walls done. I guess I'm not going to go to dinner today. I'm thinking of dinner, but time is getting away from me, Internet. Oh, I wonder if that will get me demonetized. I probably don't sing well enough to even worry about it. I sing so poorly that YouTube won't, can't even demonetize me because they're like, what song is that? Their little algorithm, their machine will go, I don't know. I thought it was an Eagle song, but I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I'm a little weird going on right there. I don't know. I'm breaking the drywall or something. Okay. Well, then I have a 12 inch trowel and uh, I'll come in here with a next coat will be a 12 inch trowel and I'll move the line down a little bit and it will look uh, depending on what I want to do. You know, depending on how nice I want to make it. Let me push this door open a little bit. Get a little more light in here. Look at the lid. Look at that lid. I don't know. Wherever I bought this mud is a little disappointed. I'm going to be honest. What happened with that is it'll drop in my mud and make flakies in it. I wanted it to be as nice as Jiffy. As nice as Jiffy. And I didn't get that. You all know that I've been using the mud to do my pond. So I'm going to save that and take it out and throw it in the pond. Man, that's sad. Oh boy. Look, when you got those crusties like that, I know you can't see me very well. 
I'll step in the line. When you get crusties like that because of mud or whatever, the only thing you can do is just uh, throw it away. That's why I carry paper towels. I carry paper towels and when that happens, I just clean everything up and wipe it away, just like that. I know I didn't buy it from my local hardware store because they don't have ready mixed mud. Everybody mixes their own. Well, I don't want to learn that new skill. <laughs> I just want to drywall. That's all I want to do. And then around the light boxes, I ordered the, because uh, it's 5 8 inch drywall, and a lot the light boxes, because of the corrugation of the uh, shipping container, the electrical boxes go in or out a little bit. And uh, so I knew that I would need uh, cheater panels on those so that I could frame them out properly. And uh, you're not allowed to have drywall exposed or an opening between an outlet box and the surface. So um, now while I don't have permitting problems out here, um, I, in fact, I don't need inspectors except for septic. I wanna make sure that uh, I have to code anyway. You know, the code's not there to hurt you, right? It's there to tell you what works and keeps people's houses safe and keeps the community safe. So uh, while I wouldn't want to be someplace where you know you're waiting months and months for a building inspector to come and inspect you, and uh, you know, of course, on the internet all you hear is the complaints. But um, good inspectors for the houses I bought have been very valuable, and in fact, uh, if you ask them, uh, "Hey, who's who's the best guy in the area?" Uh, they won't tell you that, but they'll say, well, I know that these three guys are, are these three companies are very, very fine, good companies. They'll, say, they'll, they'll put it that way. And at least they get you dialed in, right? And put you in contact. But they also tell you when you've been doing something wrong, according to code, and you can't sell a house, right? You can build it wrong. You just don't get to keep it. <laughs> you know, they'll come and make you tear it down. Uh, especially where you got earthquakes and bad things. I don't have anything bad here. Uh, say flood and uh, the wildfires. Those are the worst. Now I could add tornadoes. Uh, but, uh, you know, shipping container is already built for hurricane force wind. Uh, the windows in here are I looked for arcade windows, but it, it was during COVID and I couldn't find any. So I gave up on that idea. But I bought good windows. I believe these are Andersons for the most part. Now, will they last 100 years? Or I doubt it. Uh, but uh, the way I installed them is there's fasteners around the windows themselves. So once you remove that, you remove the trim, the windows will come right out. Uh, and so my idea of a thousand year home is that you'll easily be able to uh, do the preventative maintenance to make it last a thousand years, whether or not that is windows or electric or everything that's mechanical that can go wrong. I'm setting it up so that uh, somebody long after I'm gone can still be working, uh, repairing this house and making it a, a fully functional house. God willing, for more than a thousand years, right? Who knows, though? Texas could fall back in the ocean. We don't know. But uh, barring any anything like that, I want this house to truly be a thousand-year home. I get that right down in there, don't I? And then people will point out that it shrinks up. Yeah, it does. I go back over it with another coat. 
Then I go over it with a DAP, which is, uh, it is a elastomeric pro, pro, uh, compound. Now I'm using something I've never used for the final coat, which is the uh, Italian plaster. And uh, I don't know how that works. So I'll, before I use a product uh, that's not compatible, like DAP, I'll look and make sure that, uh, you know, it's compatible with Italian plaster. I don't know. So we'll find out when I get to that phase together. And I think I just picked up a piece of uh, sawdust from the floor. <laughs> so when that, again, when that happens, just give up. Don't even mess with it. I'm trying to save these to use them in the stock pond, but uh, <laughs> just clean your trowel off and wipe it off and uh, move forward. So I, there we go. I'm going to use that to clarify the stock pond. But when you get those little nibbly bits, just clean your clean your trowel off. What do you bother? You don't want that. You don't want to scrape that along the wall a bunch. This is just a scratch coat, nothing fancy, but I still don't want big lines in a scratch coat. I can see lines right there. I did pick up some sawdust. So when I come back in and around the post, since I didn't put tape there, I come back in with a uh, scraper and I, I scrape the edge in that I want along the post. Then if it still uh, like got big clunks of drywall there, I'll get a uh, wire wheel on a drill and I'll just cut a, cut a little path. I don't go down so deep I gouge the wood but I go just deep enough that I can, uh, you know, touch the plaster, get the plaster off. That's how I'm doing it. And um, I'm not even all the way done and it, it already looks really nice wherever I've done that. Look at that piece of sawdust again. Alright, messing up. A little clunky is messing up my mud job. Also, my thought why I went with 12 foot sheets and cut them down to avoid the seams like I did is uh, for a thousand year home, if there's no, no split in the drywall, I don't see ever getting a crack in the wall except along the post. And uh, to be honest, and somebody comes back in and redoes the Italian marble or whatever, uh, in my opinion, they probably can caulk. I'm not sure of that. But uh, they probably can cough. Uh, I'll, you know, I'll watch some videos on Italian marbling, preparing the wall. I don't know. Read some uh, the manufacturers. The stuff I ordered straight from Italy. So uh, I'll have to. Uh, I know some Italian, so I can probably get some some direct right from the. Right from the professionals who invented the product. But around the corners, I like to put a little more oomph, a little more beef around the corner. Especially this one, which will have a door slamming next to it. This one will have a door slamming, and I want to make sure that when people close the door, Drywall doesn't move. It didn't move at all. I didn't need this screw. But, better safe than sorry. Well, I gotta admit, it's looking pretty good in here. I got the south wall done. I got the ceiling done. I fixed my boo on the floor so y'all could see that. Let's see. Where is this? Can you see this tape? No, you can't see this tape. Let me back you up a little bit. 
I like you up nice, nice and close to me, so we are, we're friends. We could be friends. But, all right, we'll do it this way. Why not? Why not? Again, I'm squeezing it in there. You can't really see, but I am I'm squeezing it in there. I maybe that's why it works for me. Instead of the paper, because I squeeze it in there. I don't mess around. Those two sheets shall be one. And indeed, the next, uh, you know, this is a little six inch trowel. The next one will be, when I do the final coat, I'll come back in with a, I might give it a little wet sand or something like that, knock the edges off. But I'll come back in with the final coat with the 12 inch trowel and it will just be really nice and even. Really nice. Last little bit, a final little sprint. Again, I'm, I'm pressing that in. It kind of oozes out from the four inch trowel and attaches itself to the, to the cedar. I go the fill it all in with rough mud first. And then I go back over it with the six inch trowel. I make it reasonably smooth when I do that. I try not to leave any super high ridges or peaks. 
But if it's a reasonably good spread, I don't I don't overwork it. I don't overanalyze it. I know that I'll be following it up with uh, another coat and uh, a final top coat. And then, of course, the uh, Italian plaster. You know, if you're using paint, it's a different animal, right? There's no reason why you have to texturize or anything unless that's your style. If you uh, are careful with that. And, of course, you can always sand. You can have smooth walls in a house. You don't have to have popcorn and texturizing and all that. Just spend a little time. Uh, professionals could come in eh, Listen, if I can do a straight wall, they can do a straight wall. Don't accept texturizing uh, if you don't want it. It's a lazy man's solution to not, uh, not spend a little bit of time drywalling right. And uh, I don't usually texturize. I don't even use a texture roller. I, I, Usually do a pretty, pretty flat, straight coat. And I'm not even a class A or grade A or any of that. I, I'm just a, an average craftsman. Like a 1950s dad. <laughs> How about that? That would be a good, that would be a good, uh, good show. The 1950s dad, and he just shows you how he would have done stuff. Kind of like if you all watched that movie with Brendan Fraser years ago, uh, and uh, Blast from the Path. That was a good movie. Christopher Watkins was the, the dad, the 1950s dad. <laughs> Me up. Anyway, he showed his son how to box, how to drywall, how to how to fish, <laughs> everything. The, the 1950s dad. Why not? It's important to have pride in your own work. I think I think that's the reason why we've allowed houses to run away on us because the average guy's not willing to to do the work himself. <clears throat> One, you can't get in over your head. I, you know, you can get in way over your head. And uh, so you need to need to read, watch videos and do stuff. But there's a lot more, you know, if your dad wasn't a good teacher, I don't know if I was a good teacher. I was much more patient now than when I was a young man. But uh, plenty of YouTube videos out there for you to learn. You don't even need a, you don't even need a dad. You could learn it all from YouTube. But you can't get a hug. Well, I accept that this channel. I love you. You got a hug from me. 1950s dad. That's a good, good I bet you there's something. I know there's a grandpa out there. I saw his show. Teaching kids how to tie ties and things like that. thought that was a pretty good guy. Man, I'm messing this up instead of letting it go. I told you don't work it that much. Internet, why'd you let me there by example? I showed you what not to do by example, by messing that up, by working it too much. All right, last four foot, and then what I'll do, I'll scrape up that log. We'll, we'll do one last thing once I'm done with this. <coughs> I've just about finished up the mud in this pan. I like to wash everything out periodically anyway. As soon as I start getting chunkies in there, like I am, then I like to wash it out. <clears throat> but I do believe in young people <clears throat> doing it themselves. <clears throat> Listen, I'm just a <clears throat> itinerant builder. I got some health problems, an older guy. I would have started this when I was young. This would have been a lot easier because I could have worked all night long. And I had a partner out here to help hold and do and paint. I probably could have got one of these done in eight months. 
That's why I work in a full-time job. When I'm a little older, things take a little longer. Oh, that would have been perfect. Let's make it perfect. Let's make it perfect. All right. Let's make it perfect. woo -wee. Not half bad plastering. <clears throat> Chase these nail heads. All right. Need some quality control. Nothing I want to touch without my, my plaster right there. You all see that plaster? I don't put any back. I don't put any back because then you put a lumpy in there. So smooth it out, make it flat. Don't leave anything, and then like I said, if I had a piece of plastic, I would put a piece of plastic down on there and press on it. There you go. And then that would make it, tomorrow, I won't have to worry about lumpies in there. But let's move on to another project. So there you go, there's one of Steve's long format. I'm gonna do one of these a week. A serious look at how to do stuff. The rest of the week is just more of my journal, keeping track of things, but there we go. I, uh, I uh, put a, uh, a plaster edge along a log. I did the corners and some of them were extremely damaged and we fixed those. I popped a hole in a wall down by there, an extra hole, gone. You can't tell it at all. I taught you how to use mesh tape and uh, I do believe it's every bit as strong because I've been doing it. It outlasts me. I can at least say that. It outlasts me. So, uh, and in fact, I, the paper, uh, if you don't prime it right away and get it sealed, it, it'll pick up moisture and peel off. We've all seen uh, tape come loose. So we know that tape can have more defects for an average guy like me. Uh, whereas a sticky tape, I can't hardly go wrong. I cut it, I put it, if it doesn't stick, I cut, uh, I get a new piece that does stick. And I just work it. If I need a couple of layers on it because I damaged a wall or made a big hole. So there we go. Uh, my mud didn't come in perfect again, but I made it work by stirring it up and keeping my eye on it. Uh, looks pretty darn good. So like, subscribe, follow me along. I showed you how an average do-it-yourself or a itinerant guy can drywall all by himself and, and make it look really good. So thanks for watching. Bye.